what's going on everybody and welcome to another do you remember video in this one we'll take a look at return to castle wolfenstein return to castle wolfenstein was released in 2001 for windows 2002 for linux and mac os and 2003 for ps2 and xbox it was developed by gray matter studios also known for developing call of duty united offensive and nerve software who took part in the development of its multiplayer mode and the xbox port Grey Matter Studios was merged in 2005 into Treyarch, which we all know today to be one of the main developers of the Call of Duty franchise. Id Software, the creators of Wolfenstein 3D, released in 1992, oversaw the development of Return to Castle Wolfenstein and are credited as executive producers. In case you didn't know, Wolfenstein 3D was the first ever first-person shooter, also known as the grandfather of 3D shooters. Return to Castle Wolfenstein is a reboot of the Wolfenstein series released up to that point that includes Wolfenstein 3D and Spear of Destiny, Castle Wolfenstein and Beyond Castle Wolfenstein. The game was published by Activision Oh god! Oh my balls! At a time when they weren't greedy assholes and actually probably cared about the games they published. The PS2 and Xbox versions were subtitled Operation Resurrection and Tides of War respectively. These two ports featured some bonus missions at the beginning of the game not present on the PC version displaying how our protagonist got captured along with the other agent and reached Castle Wolfenstein. The game uses the id Tech 3 game engine, which was developed primarily for Quake 3 Arena. They even updated the engine specifically for this game to have support for large outdoor areas, which we will see that it wasn't the best decision from my point of view. When you look at the Wolfenstein logo, you can see that it's composed of a stylized double-headed eagle, prominent in most Nazi symbolism, a W which stands for, well, <laughs> Wolfenstein, and the Quake 3 Team Arena logo. The W Eagle logo is prominently seen on the cover art for the American version. Why the American version specifically? Because there is also a German version of this game which was censored. Considering how the World War II era was probably one of the worst in German history, it sort of makes sense. The swastikas were replaced with the Wolfenstein logo on every flag, armband, etc. and the Hitler portraits replaced with some other dude. The Nazis are actually called Wolves, led by Heinrich Hohler, different from the original Heinrich Himmler. Also, Hohler means Heller and Himmler means Heavener in German, so you get the idea. The game's source code was released to the public in August 2010. If you want to take a look at it, you can just google RTCW source code and a GitHub repository will most likely be one of the first results. There isn't an official remake for this game, but we do have a Steam mod on, well, Steam, called Real RTCW, which pretty much overhauls a lot of the game's visuals and mechanics to make it more or less on par with today's standards. For the purpose of this video, I did not use that mod. The only thing that I changed was a setting to make sure that the game runs at my monitor's native resolution, which is 1440p. It seems that there were some reports from around 10 years ago where a movie based on this game went into production but we haven't heard anything ever since. Not only that, but Roger Avery, co-writer for Pulp Fiction, was supposed to write and direct this movie. Since there are no reports of a remake of this game being developed, I'd be down for a good movie. As always, be warned of spoilers, because this game has the right to drink alcohol in the US. And with that being said, let's hear a short summary about the game and its story. In 1943 AD, a German prince known as Heinrich dominated the Western Europe with his army of undead and dark knights created using black magic. Until a monk called Simon the Wanderer stopped him by sealing him in a deep underground tomb. Fast forward a thousand years later, during the Second World War, the Nazi SS Heinrich Himmler had been searching for ways to win the war through science and black magic. He took an interest in Heinrich I along with his dark knights and thought he could bring him back to life to help him win the war. He founded the SS Paranormal Division and started investigating northern Egypt for some ancient tablets that could help him in his quest. The US Office of Secret Actions took hint of this and dispatched Agent 1 and BJ Blazkowicz to capture Helga von Bülow, 
a high-ranking member of the SS Paranormal Division. After failing in their mission, the agents attempted to leave Egypt, taking a plane which was later shut down, crash landing with both of them being captured by the Nazis and sent to Castle Wolfenstein for interrogation. Agent 1 was killed while being tortured, while Blaskowitz escaped and started investigating the Paranormal Division's experimentations. Several missions later, he manages to find out that the SS psychic Mariana Blavatsky plans to resurrect Heinrich near Castle Wolfenstein along with three of his Dark Knights. She does so and Heinrich rewards her by transforming her into a zombie to fight by his side. Naturally, our hero defeats Heinrich in a not-so-mortal combat and destroys Himmler's plans of winning the war through paranormal means. Now. Here's my take on this crazy ass story. Some German prince named Heinrich with a huge fucking sword who wields black magic and has an army of undead and dark knights is beat into submission by a cloaked monk who scribbles some words on the ground. That's... that's it. That's the big bad guy and that's all we know of him. What the f- Agent Juan and Blowjob Blaskowitz are tasked by the OSA office of stupid actions to investigate some paranormal shit that the Nazis are doing, which involves the undead. They think that it's a good idea to send two, just two, men to do this job. We can definitely say that the OSA is not affiliated in any way with the OSHA. Agent 1 is shocked when he finds out he's dead after being captured and Bolskowicz is left with the task of investigating and finding out what the Scheiße is going on in this castle named after Einstein's wolf. The SS, or Super Slytherin Paranormal Division, was created and tasked to search for methods to find, experiment and use the undead to win the war. Because that sounds like such a good idea and will in no way backfire. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. This paranormal team is made up of quite some strong independent women well, at least we know that the founder, Heinrich Himmler, who was an actual real person and was responsible for killing millions of people during the Holocaust, is not a sexist. Good, good, good job. Good job. After Big Dickowitz kills Ulrich and reports back to the OSA, these guys still think it's a good idea to send him alone on the next missions. In fact, as luck would have it, our man Blaskowitz is headed there now. He is? He is? Even this general is surprised that these guys are sending just one soldier to deal with what might possibly be the end of the world as we know it. Excuse me sir, but are you guys fucking idiots, pardon my French? We should probably send a small army to deal with this. Mm, interesting proposition. Alright, now this is what we're going to do. We send Agent Blaskowitz. Thankfully, our protagonist manages to overcome every challenge he is put up with and there are quite a lot of them. After finding a bunch of ass ass SS and Super Saiyan soldiers, also known as Uber Soldat, he reaches the ceremony where Braflavsky resurrects Heinrich, a medieval German with a surprisingly good American accent. What? I live again. Who are you? Just so he can die by the hands of our protagonist along with his three top Dark Knight lieutenants that are killed laughingly easy. Like I mentioned above, the story is pretty complicated and looking at the game from today's perspective is difficult to grasp. The reason for this is because back in the day gamers didn't have the attention span of a goldfish. If you think about a lot of the games in the 90s and early 2000s, the quests, descriptions and objectives would be in writing and the cutscenes were there to help with the immersiveness of the game. This exact thing happens here where the objectives and most of the information regarding the story is in writing. You'll have to read the debriefing before a mission as well as documents you gather while playing. The cutscenes you see won't give you the whole picture and if you don't read these documents you'll finish the game wondering what happened and who some of the characters are. The reason I'm saying this is because I can still remember the game as a kid, but I can't remember anything about the story other than the fact that I was killing Nazis and in the end the big bad dude that was in the intro. That was it. I had no idea why I was doing all of that, so I'm afraid that in this day and age a story like this probably wouldn't work as well. So let's talk a little bit about nostalgia. 
Basically, nostalgia is associated with a longing for the past, for some events or stuff that happened back in the day, the good old times. Now, as crazy as this emotion of melancholy is, when you feel nostalgia, it can also hide the fact that some things that happened in the past weren't as good as you thought they were. You don't want to, that, to do that either. You think you do, but you don't. I'm sure that a lot of you felt nostalgia at least once, probably when listening to music or smelling something familiar, which was related to some event, and then you immediately wanted to go back and relive that memory. The more I played this game, the more I started to realize that some of its aspects weren't as good as I thought they were. I loved fighting Nazis and the whole World War II setting. I loved that it's a first person shooter and I loved the paranormal aspect and the way they included the fantasy side of things. I didn't play the multiplayer this time around and this is a video aimed at the single player experience, but I do remember that its multiplayer component was unbelievable. This was before Call of Duty, mind you. Last but not least is the story, which was the aspect that left a sour taste in my mouth because of the characters that we don't really get to know much of. The antagonists are introduced for a couple of levels and then they are killed off without any character progression whatsoever. Heinrich, for instance, which the first cinematic made him look like a fucking badass that you couldn't wait to fight, is summoned, you kill him, and that's it. That is the whole interaction with our endgame antagonist. These were the results of nostalgia for me. The memories I have with this game was that I got to spend time with my brothers as a child, that they would pass me through the horror levels that I was too terrified to play through on my own, when reality kicks in, you realize that this game wasn't as extraordinary as I thought it was, at least from a story perspective. But at the same time, it might also be the fact that I played it now in 2023 and I have different expectations, which is unreasonable to say the least. Let's finally get to the game. And as we do, we are met with the main menu, obviously. It's not special in any way other than the fact that it has a very patriotic and military-ish vibe. A lot of this is thanks to the soundtrack piece that plays in the background. The composer, Bill Brown, managed to express through his soundtrack the tension of the gunfights, The terror and unknown, the hyper-awareness and unsafety that can be experienced in the tombs and crypts by the paranormal, all of this can be felt through his music. Some of my personal favorites from the soundtrack are, of course, Bass Alarm, assassination and of course SS Elite Guard As we try to start the game, we have the option of difficulty, which essentially bullies you if you choose the lowest one. I personally chose that because honestly I really didn't want to get hurt. All I can say is that the game itself wasn't necessarily hard and that was to be expected for that difficulty, but the AI ruined it for me as I said before and I will talk about this in a second. After choosing your difficulty, we are met with a classic US patriotic logo of a bald eagle. A cutscene ensues and we are met with some leading officers of the OSA, Office of Secret Actions, that have just been informed of our protagonist and his partner's capture. They are going through a debriefing which gives the player a short summary of what's going on and what we should expect from the story. Every main mission will always begin with such a debriefing and gives the player a summary of what the fuck just happened in the game up to that point as well as a short description of what's going to happen in the next one. I guess it's good enough for someone who isn't willing to read through a bunch of text. 
These officers also make the decision of leaving the protagonist, aka BJ Oktoberfest and his partner Agent 1, to fend for themselves and hope for them to find a way out. Doofenshmirtz? No wait, Blaskowitz, like a bunch of other 2000s first person shooter protagonists, is voiced by Helen Keller. And the only things you'll hear from him are some grunts and pain sounds when getting hit. Side note, in the PS2 and Xbox versions, he did have a proper voice. Damn Nazis. Sounds like the welcoming committee. This is too hot. Check the map for someplace else to land. We do get to see how he looks from the main menu as well as several other cutscenes from the game. We don't really get much information about him either, but what we know for certain is that he is for Nazis what the Doom guy is for demons. As soon as the mission cutscene is over, we will also see a debriefing screen with the mission objectives and a description of the mission itself. Very nicely done with a photo of the location and looks like a top secret document. Every mission is split up in multiple parts. This is of course done because the mission itself is actually pretty long and spans on several locations at a time. The first mission for instance starts at Castle Wolfenstein and goes through to the nearby village, crypts, church and the archaeological dig. As soon as the game starts, we are met with a scientist who interrogates Agent 1 to death and a soldier is sent to the dungeons below to retrieve our protagonist. Even to this day, I'm asking myself how the hell did a Nazi soldier with a gun manage to get killed by surprise after looking up at the exact spot where Black Snitch was hanging. Not only that, but how the fuck did he manage to get up there? There aren't any parallel walls for him to manage to do that and how the hell was he even hanging like that? It's ridiculous to say the least, but anyway, it's all literally fun and games and it's ridiculous of me to expect logical sense in a game about Nazi zombies, so let's just move on. In case you didn't hear me the first 10 times saying this since this video started, this is a first person shooter and as we gain control of BJ we can immediately see that. We start off equipped with a knife, the kick and a pistol retrieved from the soldier he just killed. The game allows for stealth combat, this is where the knife and some other silenced weapons will come useful. I like the way the stealth feature was done, but it may come off as annoying at times because the way that we are used to seeing stealth done in games nowadays. Here the AI is very sensitive and there is no alert status to warn you that they can see you. You maybe have like a second or two after they spot you to hide quickly, Otherwise, they will start shooting and the nearby enemies will be alerted as well. If they manage to sound the alarm, it's even worse because most of the soldiers in the area will be more cautious even if you manage to turn it off. Opening the doors silently is also advised as well as getting a backstab whenever possible. There are a couple of missions where stealth is required and the mission will fail if you're detected. But other than that, it's completely optional and loud combat will inevitably ensue sooner or later. When that happens, a shot to the head or ass will do the trick. If you thought I'd make this video without mentioning the elite's asses in those leather pants, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but, but now I know why my brothers actually liked this game back in the day. Since we're talking about the elite's asses, uh, let's take a look at the enemies we encounter. We'll be fighting three types of enemies. Nazi soldiers, the undead and super soldiers. From the very beginning of the game we will meet Nazi soldiers and they will have progressively harder variants as we go through the game. The most annoying ones will be the black guards or the paratroopers using the FG-42 rifle, a very powerful gun that can kill you in 4 or 5 direct shots, so beware of that. The undead are another type of enemies that we'll come up against, we'll meet them in like 3 or 4 missions, but as few as they are, they are very significant and memorable. The undead are composed of the zombies, fire zombies, skeleton warriors and dark knights. The zombies are slow and will release spirits to hit you from a distance. As soon as you hit them enough, they will fall to the ground. But be cautious, it's not the end of it. You'll need to continue killing them until they're dead, otherwise they'll keep coming back. The fire zombies are much more durable and will spit fire. 
which deals a ton of damage and burns you for quite a while. The skeletons offer another challenge, which is that if you hit their shields, the bullets will ricochet back at you. The trick here is to hit their legs or some other vulnerable spots. A very ridiculous thing regarding the Dark Knights was that throughout the game, we keep hearing stories about their greatness, that they are the lieutenants of Heinrich and some of the most powerful undead out there. At the end of the game, Blavatsky uses three super soldiers, which are an absolute powerhouse and a fucking pain to kill, to convert them to Dark Knights in the resurrection ceremony. Let me show you what actually happens after that conversion. What the fuck is this piece of shit? So, according to the Wolfenstein fandom data, this stupid ass conversion brings the super soldiers from a whopping 1300 health points to 110. Now, it is speculated that these Dark Knights were the most powerful beings alive, or dead, because, well, they have medieval armor and fight with a sword and shield, so. In their time, it makes sense to be almighty. In this time, however, they are in no way challenging to the World War II era weaponry. Still an absolutely ridiculous conversion nonetheless. Speaking of the super soldiers, they are the third enemy type, which consists of, well, super soldiers, the proto soldiers, which are the prototype of a super soldier, and the lopers, which are the handicapped super soldiers. These three are arguably the most challenging enemies you will encounter, aside from the bosses. The super soldiers are actually bosses in the game. They can swap through three different types of guns, the RPG, Venom Gun and Tesla Gun, which make them a force to be reckoned with. The proto soldiers are rather annoying, but nothing that a couple of RPG hits won't take care of. While the Lopers are the most annoying of the bunch and can lower your health points lightning fast if you're not careful because of how they leap around and suck the energy out of you with electricity. They can even hit you through the fence floors and can make it hard for you to pass through certain areas of the game. The good thing is that you'll have a pretty good arsenal of weapons to use to take care of these leaping assholes as well as the rest of the enemies. There's quite a huge variety of weapons to choose from. Pistols, submachine guns, machine guns, experimental weapons, etc. I'm not going to go into details of each one of them, but I can happily say that the classic World War II weapons are here. I'm talking about the MP40, Thompson submachine gun and the Mauser sniper rifle, which is pretty much a car 98. I mostly used the MP40 because of the amount of ammo that can be found, the Mauser sniper rifle for long range, the FG-42 as much as ammo allowed me to because of how powerful it is and some other suppressed weapons for stealth killing such as the Sten submachine gun and Snooper sniper rifle for stealth long range killing. The heavy gunnery such as the Tesla and Venom guns I used for tougher opponents and bosses and the rest were ignored completely. Grenades were thrown in an awkward fashion and were difficult to aim. The flamethrower was dangerous because I had to get close and personal to get a good shot which exposed me for enough time to get a good amount of damage, so not worth it and that's about it. The problem with such a huge arsenal of weapons and the fact that you can use all of them is that there will be a lot of keybinds. All the numbered keys from 1 to 0 are bound to a weapon class. All of this makes it extremely hard to remember which weapon is where and it gets even more annoying when you have to press that key multiple times to go down the list to where the gun you want is placed. Thankfully, the guns I used most I knew where they were placed, but it was still quite annoying to switch between them. A technique that I used to avoid and deal damage was to strafe left and right as much as possible, hide around corners and jump a lot. I highly suggest you to try this. It doesn't work all the time, but is the best way of doing it in my opinion. But let's say that you do get damaged, which will happen quite often. This game was released at a time where the self-healing feature wasn't yet present or popular in video games. So in order to replenish your health, you will have to find health packs or eat food. They're usually present in a fair amount of places, some on your story path and for others you'll need to go out of your way to find them. Usually you'll do the latter out of desperation because of low HP. 
Aside from your health resources, you will also find stamina boosts in the form of alcohol, which will raise your maximum stamina on the next sprint. I personally didn't sprint as much as I should, but I assume that in harder difficulties this might have a better impact on the gameplay. We also have armor boosts in the form of jackets and helmets, and this is definitely something to look for, as in later levels of the game the armor has a significant impact in reducing the damage you take. Now, let me tell you about an incredible unlimited resource that you can use to make this game a lot easier and you should definitely not feel bad for using it. The quick save. Thankfully you can exploit this as much as you want and I highly recommend you to do so. The game is not difficult per se, but that cursed AI, their damned surprise attacks, a misused ladder or other dumb decisions, the quick save will literally save you quickly if you don't quick save right before you die, that is. When it comes to the environments, there's no shortage of variety either. Each mission design is unique in its own way and even the mission itself has several environments that you'll go through. From the castle to crypts, villages, air bases, laboratories and so on. You won't feel like the areas you visit are similar to one another, but you will get the feeling of emptiness to some of them. For instance, the first compound where you need to stealthily go through the open fields, as challenging as it might be, is rather empty. Same goes for another couple of levels. As nice as this open world feeling is, it doesn't quite work and it takes you out of the immersive first person experience. Adding to these zones the sniper soldiers that you might encounter didn't help the experience either because they sucked the HP out of you like a scoped vacuum. They did add some non-hostile NPCs to some indoor areas, probably to make it feel more alive, but it definitely didn't help that much. The layouts of the levels are very well designed and even with that downside that I mentioned, it shows that they did their best to design their areas as well as possible. Most of the game is self-explanatory and you'll most likely know what you need to do, but there are instances where some things that you need collecting, such as documents, are placed in areas where it's a little difficult to see. Throughout the whole game I only had this problem once, where I didn't get a document needed to progress. This is because the game levels are open-ish and you might have to backtrack to retrieve some items that you've missed. This also allows for exploration and solving puzzles to discover secrets. I have no problem with this level design. The only issue I found was that there is no map to keep track of places you've already been to. By pressing the N key on the keyboard you will open BJ's journal where you can read the reports of past missions as well as the current, ongoing or finished objectives. If we ever get a remake for this game, which I'm still hoping for, a proper map for better exploration and easier seeking of treasures will be extremely useful. The AI of this game is odd to say the least. Most of them will just shoot and charge at you and will of course have the same cheap mechanics of being placed behind corners or closed doors to surprise shoot you in the face. Same thing that happened in Max Payne, I mentioned that in my video there as well. Seems like it's a pattern to the early 2000s games to make it more challenging for the player. The undead and the skeletons will charge at you, but that's fine, I mean they use melee weapons and that's their only way of attacking whereas the zombies will try and get up close while shooting their spirits. They will also surprise you in some cases, where they might get out of certain walls, but again, as these sections are meant to be horror-ish, these jump scares are to be expected. So let's talk about the bosses. There are three to be more specific. The first one is Olaric at the end of Mission 2 Dark Secret. I have to say that the way they introduced Olaric was pretty damn cool. Since the start of the game, we are presented to one of our antagonists, Helga von Belomi and she is presented as a very despicable, bossy and entitled bitch. Enough of your stalling. Tell me yes or no, will it work? Truly worthy of the Nazi uniform. As soon as we reach the defiled church, she finds an ancient dagger artifact and Professor Zenf, who is there with the task of extracting some goo from a dark knight for experimentation, tries to warn her of the unforeseen consequences that would occur if she takes that dagger. The impatient bitch that she is, she kills him, and while attempting to take the dagger, unleashes Olaric, who absolutely devours her. As soon as we enter the church, we go to the gate where we just saw the cutscene, and we see Olaric running menacingly towards us, earth shaking with every step he takes, 
the undead faces attached to him screaming in agony and sending powerful spirits towards Blaskowitz trying to take his life away. Thankfully, you can just run back where you came from, which pretty much triggers an exploit where Ulrich remembers he left the stove open and walks right back. Uh, I'm not even sorry for using this exploit considering the PTSD that this boss gave me as a kid. The second boss, or bosses, are the super soldiers. More specifically, the super soldier using the Tesla gun in the X-Labs, but I personally found the two super soldiers right before the last level to be even more challenging. Considering how extremely hard to take down they were, they were even harder than Heinrich in my opinion. And yeah, Heinrich is pretty much the last boss and I have so many issues with that fight. Firstly, there's the Dark Knight thing, which was bonkers. And then Heinrich himself was so underwhelming. He is presented throughout the whole game, if you read the notes of course, as being a freaking badass of a warrior. But all he does is force pull you to him, you run away, dispose of every bullet you have on his ass, and wait for him to die. All he has is a huge amount of health, so as long as you keep your distance, you're pretty much good. I love the way that he died though, in a freaking blood splash, that was pretty cool. Oh, and another thing, how does a German prince from the 10th century have an absolutely perfect English accent? You fool, you know as well as I that I cannot be destroyed. And not even British English, but American. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I personally did not see that coming, get it? I'd even ask why the hell does he know English in the first place, but leaving that aside, that accent really took me out of the immersion. At least the rest of the Nazis we fight actually do have a German accent when speaking English, so there's that. Oh, it's freezing out here. <laughs> it's going to be even colder than last night. I hope we get some new blankets soon. As this being the final boss, this is also He's the American. end of the game. But we are still left with one very interesting cutscene that I liked. We see Himmler looking at the ceremony site where Heinrich just died. Until this point, we heard of Himmler only through texts, him being the leader and founder of the SS Paranormal Division. Not only that, but his first name is also Heinrich. Not sure if it's a coincidence, but I still thought it's a nice detail. What is most interesting, however, is that Himmler, who was actually a real person during World War II, bought the Wevelsburg Castle in 1934 to be used as an SS school. Karl Maria Willigat, an Austrian soldier and occultist recruited by Himmler himself, convinced Himmler to use this castle as a cult site for occult rituals and practices. Later on, it would also be the center of archaeological excavations in the region to study medieval and ancient history. If all of this sounds familiar, it's because the Wevelsburg Castle is the inspiration for Castle Wolfenstein, which is also the main area of the SS Paranormal Division led by Himmler, and it's used for excavations and study of medieval history. The difference here is that they discover the undead, and this is where the game's plot begins. I think the game was rather fun to play, but as with a lot of the older games, it does start to show its age, and some aspects are very easily visible now, such as the need for quick save manipulation. There were some weird bugs here and there, one related to music. Sometimes when doing stealth sections, the battle music would randomly get triggered even though no one spotted me. Another one that was quite annoying was switching between weapons might have caused a weird delay of the weapon appearing. Other than that, I can't really complain, it was, it was a pretty smooth experience. And last but not least, the game was rather short. I managed to finish it in less than 6 hours much shorter than I expected, and this isn't like with my Max Payne or Prince of Persia playthroughs, where I already knew a lot of the game, this one I barely remembered as I never finished it properly. I do believe though that a lot of the emphasis with Return to Castle Wolfenstein was the multiplayer. Even though it's obvious that they put a lot of effort into the story and the amount of detail and historical accuracy is there, the multiplayer is probably one of the biggest contributing factors here. It's what would pretty much keep the game alive after finishing the story. That and the mod support, which is incredible thanks to the id tech engine. You can even see the mods tab in the main menu, 
That's how obvious it was that they supported mods and were happily serving that support to the gaming community. To wrap things up, I definitely recommend trying this game. As with most old games such as this, you can find it at absolute dirt cheap and I think that it should be part of your library. The game really is a good first person shooter. It encompasses a complex dark World War II story with a paranormal twist, a great variety of weapons and levels, loads of enemies to fight, and it's just fun. Now, you might notice that I didn't say it was a good story, because to me it didn't feel that way. If you want to get immersed in it, make sure to read the documents and pay close attention. But realistically speaking, the characters are forgettable and the only one who was interesting to me at least was the end boss Heinrich. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see enough or learn more about him. To be honest, I'd now want a game set in the 10th century Germany where we can learn more about his conquests and fight him there. I'd want to fight him at its absolute best, know more about him, how did he influence the Nazis if he did, who was Simon the Wanderer and what actually transpired in the first cutscene of the game. There's a huge gap between keeping the player in the dark to allow him to bring his own theories to keep the game alive years after its release and not giving him enough. I feel like we didn't get enough here and they didn't follow up to this story in any way either. So here's hoping for something to be done about this, but I really doubt it at this point. I think this pretty much concludes this video. If I missed some interesting points regarding this game, please, please comment below for me, but also for the other people here who are interested in learning more. With that being said, thank you so much for watching and I really hope to see you in the next one. Peace and carrots.